there are a lot of great $600,000, million dollar, $2 million dollar homes. Your biggest decision is do I want to go to the beach or the pool Love and it. what am I going to grill for dinner? South Carolina, Hilton Head, what's going on there? People with families, everybody loves Hilton Head. One of the best ways for an American family to create intergenerational wealth is to own some land. It's in high demand and they don't make it anymore. I'm standing on the beach of the beautiful island of Hilton Head, South Carolina, where after the Civil War, black people owned most of this. But over the decades, the land was lost. And to this day, we got black folks that are still fighting to keep their little piece of the American dream. By 1910, African Americans owned around 16 million acres of land, much of it acquired through purchases and homesteading. But after years of violence, intimidation, and legal trickery, most of it was taken. Texas A&M law professor Thomas Mitchell has been tracking that loss for two decades. Historically, if we're talking about African Americans, despite this incredible acquisition of land after the Civil War, most of that property was not considered prime real estate. For example, Hilton Head, South Carolina. Until 1950, Hilton Head was remote. There wasn't a bridge from the South Carolina mainland out to Hilton Head Island, and the island was owned by majority African-Americans. Right. What does South Carolina do? They build a bridge. Real estate developers realize, oh, there's a great economic opportunity, and they have the visions of what has become Hilton Head. The indigo, rice, and long staple cotton of the past have given way to the golf, tennis, and swimming of today's leisure society. They started buying out individual families, and there's hardly any black landowners left. And what's just happened as our society has advanced, areas that were once considered the backwaters no longer are the backwaters. We're on a mission right now. <laughs> to get this tangerine. The vulnerability of black land isn't limited to the coastlines. It's widespread throughout the United States, even in my hometown of Tallahassee. Sandra Thompson learned just how hard it can be to maintain possession of land that developers want to get their hands on. I remember growing up in Tallahassee. Uh -huh. This was the sticks. <laughs> I went to school with people that lived out here. We'd be like, you, you live in the boonies, in the boondocks. It's actually now zone urban fringe. Urban fringe. Urban fringe. People try to buy it. All the time. Sandra's family were sharecroppers on this land. Her grandparents bought it in 1946 using money their son made serving in the military. But their will didn't clearly identify a single person who would inherit and manage the property. When my grandmother passed away, it was left equally to her descendants. So. That essentially created heir's property. Heir's property. On the most basic level, what is it? Heir's property is communal type property where your ancestors would have purchased the land and once they passed away, it transfers to the next generation and then their descendants. It's fractional ownership. A property that could be owned by 200 people. Any one of those heirs could sell their percentage. That new owner can go to the court and say, well, we can't agree on how to manage this land. And force the rest of the folk to sell it, even if they don't want to? Yes. And so it was essential for us to move it out of heirs' property status. And that process costs from probate to title clearing close to about $10,000. Wait, so you, you own the land? but then you had to pay $10,000 to own the land again? Exactly. Because of the cost, a lot of families don't clear title of their property. And so then it keeps them in a vulnerable economic risk position. African Americans disproportionately own heir's property that every lawyer who was knowledgeable about this ownership form would tell them, run away. Do not ever own it under this structure. And so you're, you're, you're having a population sitting in this very vulnerable way, and oftentimes in a way that they don't understand how the law operates, sometimes until a lawsuit is filed. But land been in our family for at least 125 years. 
started with my great grandfather. Land is for me a lot of memories, part of my roots. I was proud of the name Lewis. We worked to have something. And I guess we say we lost it. The Lewis family owned 480 acres of land and a homestead in northern Louisiana. Because the land was heirs' property, several distant family members were able to sell their share of it to a local timber developer named James Tuggle. Tuggle forced the sale of the land that happened last year. My great-great-grandfather raised 13 kids where that house sits. I mean, there are so many heirs tied into the Lewis properties It'll make your head spin. Taxes were always paid on time. We were under the impression that could no one person from the family just up and sell any part of the property without anyone being notified. Do you all know the relatives that sold their, their part? I've only seen one once. You in New York, wherever, going on with your life, you don't really know nothing about this little country spot right here. You don't know nothing about this here. As part of the legal process, the for sale of heirs' property has to be publicly announced. In the Lewis's situation, a local newspaper posted a notice in the weeks leading up to the auction. This is a small town. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is not like the Washington Post or New York Journal or whatever, you know. There's no paper out here in the country that's being delivered to the doorstep. You know, ain't no ball riding no bicycle throwing no paper on the front porch down here. So walk in and just do a family like that. I don't understand that. My mama keep the insurance on this house. She keep a roof on this house. She keep these bills paid on this house. You know, my thing is, your house has been here for years. Because of technicality, you are not, you're not uprooted up. A family. Shortly after James Tuggle completed the purchase of the Lewis property last year, the sheriff evicted Michael. So this is where your, your My trailer, trailer was sitting here. Those are the steps to the front entrance. I called the sheriff. Well, it's his property. He can do with what he wants. The sheriff saying that Tuggle could do what he wants. He can do what he wants. It's his property. I suggest you move the trailer. He says, well, that's all I can tell you. Is there anything I can help you with? I told him no. Michael ended up with a little over $2,800 for his share of the property. He used it to relocate his trailer home to a half-acre lot nearby. Still got to put in a water line. The water line is across the road. I could be angry angry to the point that I want to do something to somebody. I mean, you're talking about 125 years of family heritage. Michael invited us in to see the documents from the local district court that informed them their land was being targeted for sale. This is a, a petition that came to us via the sheriff department. This is the very first document that we received. You're hereby cited to comply with the demand contained in the petition, da 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 which the office is in the town of Homer and said, Paris State, you have There's 15 days after this. There's a lot of words thrown at somebody that really can't understand some of the, the lingo, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And we get up to the office to find out exactly what it is that they're trying to say. To make sense of these documents and get a better understanding of what happened to the Lewises, we visited the clerk of court, Brian Flynn. Anything involving a partition lawsuit is filed here in this office. I am the custodian of all of these records that you see. So you want to take this out in the front? Yeah, we take it out. All right, you do. When it comes to developers, what's the mechanism that they use to track down family members? Okay, they'll come into this office, and then generally you know the piece of property that you're looking for. 
you know, whether that is because it's got some timber on it or something of that nature. Then what you do is you can look at the tax assessor's office and the tax assessor's office will give you just a visual plat, a hand-drawn plat of how the property went from one person to the next person to the next person. And that's how they'll initially find out who owns the property. So what happened with the Lewises? The Lewises are a family that is spread out across the United States. So James Terry Tuggle buys into that property. Now, he didn't just buy a sliver of that property. He ended up buying somewhere in the neighborhood of 20%. Understood. Once he owns that, yeah. he can force the entire thing to be sold. And that's what he did. Which he did. I smell it. <laughs> <laughs> Over the course of a decade, Tuggle, a timber developer in town, bought the shares of more than 20 people connected to the Lewis property, most of them from out of state. He declined our request for an interview and didn't respond to our written questions. So the sale happens at the sheriff's office where it is publicly open for bid and it's sold for $555,000. And a bargain of a well, price, I, right? Well, I mean, I don't know, $550,000. For 500 acres? Oh, I've seen 17 acres of land sold for $1,800. And believe me, that, you know, that's disturbing. The sale he's talking about was made in 2001 to a real estate investor named James Steele, who advertises his ability to force the sale of Air's property. We caught up with him at a sheriff's auction nearby. All right, suit number 41821, Trig Investments, LLC versus Maurice Hunter et al. The minimum acceptable bid is $2,294.25. The floor is now open for bids. Do I hear a bid? A bid cost. Okay. $2,294.25 is sold. Just stick your name right there. Morning, Jim. Morning. How you doing? Fine. What just happened today here? Well, I bought an interest in a piece of land, an undivided interest, you know, when it's inherited and there's a lot of heirs. Mm -hmm. I owned 24 acres out of the 52. Before, before today you did? Yes. And now you came and purchased the rest. How much have you paid in total for 52 acres? I would have to add that up because, don't get me wrong, I, I do a lot of these and mm -hmm. I can't keep them all in my head. Mm -hmm. How does heirs' property fit into your overall business model? To be truthful with it, it's probably 90% of my business model. Even going back to the Civil War, we're doing mm -hmm. something that the people in the Civil War had it. I mean, they were slaves and they had it. And I've had other landowners come to me and say, well, would you file a lawsuit for me and do this? Because I don't want to be the bad guy. You be the bad guy because you already been the bad guy. You do so this you all did, the time. So, you so, so I'll be... So I'll you be the bad guy. You recognize that what you're doing is perceived. You look at me as evil. No, no, no. I don't know. No, I'm oh, saying no. I'm no, I don't know. I don't. No, no, no. No. What I'm saying is, to to the to the family member that wants to sell, you're bringing the bank. You're bringing the money to the family member that doesn't want to sell. You're evil. Probably in their eyes. Yeah. Yeah. And some people are sincere about not wanting to sell. They mean it. Most don't. Most say that but they don't mean it. They just want but instant he, gratification and money now. But there are some that don't want to sell, and it's usually the ones that live on the property that are getting free rent, free everything. It's their, it's their land, that's not free rent. Well, they only own nice. a minuscule portion of it. I've heard it thousands of times. You can't make me sell my land. And then I respond back, I say, yes, I can. But it's my land. Well, it used to be. Jim, that ain't, that ain't really. <laughs> the bottom line is what you have is these families who many times owned property for generations, including families who acquired ownership right after the end of the Civil War. Their property rights are instantaneously extinguished, and then they are stripped of a significant amount of their overall wealth, not just their real estate wealth, because African Americans disproportionately who have assets it's represented in land and homes. So their single greatest asset now has been sold at a fire sale and they're getting pennies on the dollar. The way that the system is set up, it seems like it disproportionately affects African-Americans who through legal trickery and 
threats of violence and lynching and whatnot, land has been taken from them. Well, you I see what I'm saying? I hadn't lynched anybody like this. So <laughs> <laughs> but, but, and you know, and people like me, I'm <laughs> at least nefarious. I'm, I'm a I'm opportunist, I'm a racist, I've been called everything in the world. No, I'm not a racist. I don't go after the certain things just because you're black or you're Asian or you what? You going after the land. the land, the land. So if everybody in the world could sell a piece of land to their brother or their sister or their son, and nobody could build factories, nobody could do anything. It would always be out of commerce and never be able to use. There's no remedy to get it back into commerce. And and do you and, think and, it's fair? It has to be. It has to be fair. Jim Steele wasn't involved in the forced sale of the Lewis property. James Tuggle, the developer who was, let Greg stay on the land, but his mother decided to leave. This is my mother's house. When she retired, this became her home. Why did she leave here? She left here because she was nervous about whether or not her mama's house was going to be pushed down and whether or not her house was going to be next. She couldn't sleep at night. She just didn't feel safe. Greg's mother, Miss Trudy Stanley, and other members of the Lewis family tried to formalize their ownership when they found out it was being targeted for sale. Mr. Tuggle was years ahead of them in the process and outbid them during last year's auction. Shortly after that, Miss Stanley moved in with her daughter in Washington, D.C. It's painful to realize that I don't have it anymore. It's not right. I didn't say I'm not part of the property. Only someone else came, sold that part, so they affect the whole family. We didn't know the law, so we could protect it. So we lost it like that. Every year, we paid the taxes. We didn't just leave it alone to forget it. We took our resources and made sure we got the taxes paid. Everything that we did. Why do you think your grandfather didn't make a will? Well, I don't think back during that day they were thinking about making a will. But my grandfather prepared for what he knew at the time and what he had to do at the time, prepare for my family. So I know the difference. Because you need a will. Because there was going to be chaos in their families. How important was the land to you? 420 acres of land. It means a lot. And to lose it, you had no defense, you know what to do, lost it. That was devastating. It still is. It will ever, forever be that way. So that's a loss. Part of the reason we have in the African American community such a high incidence of heirs' property is that when African Americans move from the status of being property themselves mm -hmm. to after the Civil War, being able to become landowners, right. hardly any of these families were able to structure the ownership in a way that would be stable because most African American families had no access to attorneys. And there's studies in various southern states that show that it's somewhere between 10 and 40 percent of all property African Americans own is heirs' property because a huge percentage of these families don't have wills or estate plans. And what they know is their property transfers to their heirs. There is a huge racial will-making or estate planning gap. The average white family has 10 times the assets of the average black family. Real estate developers or speculators or investors, they know that. And so what they do is they give a lowball price because they know that the family can't even compete against the lowball price. According to United States Forest Service research, there's around $28 billion worth of heirs' property in the South. And that's a conservative estimate. Thomas Mitchell drafted legislation designed to help families hold on to theirs. So far, it's passed in 16 states. So the first provision is, if somebody files one of these lawsuits and requests a court to order the forced sale of the property, what the other owners are then entitled to is to buy out the person who asked for the forced sale. There had been this narrative that black landowners were inevitably gonna be extinct 
by about now. I was like, why are we going to sit back and watch more and more property and land and homes go, and then on the back end, call for reparations, as opposed to trying to stabilize right. the ownership so that it's not dissipated right. 20 or 30 years from now. My family homesteaded these properties. They raised families on these properties. Mr. Tuggle, he ain't gonna build nothing on it. It's all for the timber. All for the timber. Far as you can see on all these hills, this is fresh cut. I mean, right after he purchased, he went to cutting. It was in the family for 125 years. All of this? All of this. My aunts and uncles' houses sat up on the top up here. You can see that it's been wiped clean of pine. And everything that you see pushed up, they're going to come back and burn it and then replant. This is important that you stick together. You keep your interests together. You hold tight to your interests. And if you plan on doing anything with your interest, make sure you do it in the family. Keep it in the family. That's, that's where we fell short. Because whatever they got from him now is probably gone. Just like everything else. <laughs>